the first thing, just for those of you who don't know HubSpot, we're a software company. It's software as a service. Uh, it's a marketing software platform. And our big differentiation against a lot of other different solutions out there are two things. One is we focus on inbound and we really enable inbound. Uh, we're big believers in inbound. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, and the second thing is that we're a big all-in-one platform. So we have lots of different tools all in one place. So rather than using one system for social media and a different system for blogging and a different system for uh, marketing automation and something else for personalization in your website and something else for lead scoring and something else for analytics, we put all that stuff into one platform so it's all in the same place and it all connects. Uh, we have, we actually focus, it's really funny, we focus on the mid-market, but we have lo lots of customers. We have 10,000 customers in 56 countries, uh, even though we only have two offices around the world. Uh, and even though we only focus on sort of companies from 10 to 2,000 employees, we actually have a bunch of really big brands that use, or use our, our customers as well. Uh, and it's been a really, really neat experience to be able to grow that from nothing to a huge number of customers. Uh, you know, you talk about selling to people that believe the same things that you believe. Uh, we believe that people, all of us in this room, and the way that we purchase things for ourselves, the way that we buy things for our businesses, that we've changed how we make those purchasing decisions. Uh, and that people skip television ads, people are on the do not call list, the way that you want to engage with companies with other people has fundamentally changed. And we find that in our sales process, in our marketing process, people who believe this, like really at their core believe it, don't just say the words, because a lot of people say the words, but they don't really mean it. But for people who really, really believe it, we have a very fast sales cycle and they end up being super successful customers. And one of the things that hold us back sometimes is people that don't believe that. Um, so the one thing that I'll bring up about this type of marketing and inbound marketing, which I think is very interesting, is that if you're not doing inbound marketing, you're basically renting the capability of building an audience from someone else. So if you're paying Google for Google AdWords, Google has done the hard work of building up a huge audience and they're renting that capability back to you on a per click basis. If you're taking out even an ad in a newspaper, the newspaper has built up a big audience or an ad on a website or on a blog or something like that, someone else has done the hard work of building an audience and you're renting the capability from them. The problem with renting something is as soon as your budget dries up or your credit card goes over the limit or you're out of funding in your company, then guess what? You don't have that asset anymore because it was never yours to begin with. You've been renting it, right? The interesting thing about building something and building your own audience, which is fundamentally what inbound is about, is that you don't pay for it on a, you're not renting it from yourself, right? So what's interesting is we look at lots of stats related to this, but one stat that I love is that more than half of the leads we generate at HubSpot are from things we didn't do this month. So there's one blog article in particular, a blog article I wrote six years ago, very, very early in history. I still get about 50 leads a month from that blog article that I wrote six years ago, right? And so that's something, again, if I was renting that blog, renting space in the blog article from someone else, I'd be paying on a per click basis for that still today, but it's totally free. So it has this huge, it's this asset that we built that keeps paying dividends over time. And that's one of the things I love, love, love about inbound marketing. One of the things that I think can give you a big competitive advantage in your business. In order to build this type of a model, you need to stop thinking like a marketer and you need to think like you're a media company. You want to be a media mogul for whoever you're selling to. I just was talking to a woman who has a business about uh, selling to parents and it's about you know, Montessori toys for young children, right? You need to think of what are the things where, you know, I have two kids at home, both under the age of three, and we were chatting about this, it's a very interesting business. And she needs to think about what is the blog or the video or the podcast or what's the thing that my wife and I are going to want to read and consume that's related to her business? Not about her products, but what's related to her business that she wants to consume. She needs to think about, she needs to be Oprah but attract my wife and I within the context of what she's selling. And what I think that all HubSpot customers try to do is try to be that for their market. You heard about the, all the things that Unidesk was talking about and they try to be one of those valuable resources for the IT folks that they sell to. And we try to do the same thing at HubSpot. So in some ways, our competition is actually much broader than other people that sell marketing or sales software. Our competition has become sites where places that Andrew would go to get information, like it's where he spends his time to learn about this stuff, right? And so it could be places like Marketing Profs or Marketing Sherpa or other marketing-centric web marketing land. There's a lot of like marketing publications out there. In some ways, those are our competition as well and something you guys should think about. If you're doing this well and you're pretending to be Oprah for your market, you want to build up marketing assets. And I talked about, what those, uh, talked about how those assets can pay off over time. 
Uh, we built lots of them at HubSpot, so we've been at this for a while. I've been at the company for seven years. I was the fifth employee. Uh, and we now have over 6,000 blog articles that we've written. We write over 100 new ones each month. We have hundreds of you know, webinars and videos and presentations, all sorts of things. Once you've built a lot of these things up, they continue to pay more and more dividends. Uh, and so the benefit is of this type of stuff accrues over time. So the earlier you start, the better. If you do this stuff well, you can build a very, very large audience. That's an asset that you own and control. So it's not something you're renting. So we get a, we, our blog gets 1.5 million visits a month. Uh, which, you know, even for, uh, there's probably some consumer startups that would be happy to have that traffic. We're a B2B company, so we're super happy to have that traffic. Um, and we pay nothing for any of that traffic. Uh, we have a huge opt-in uh, email list of people that want to get emails from HubSpot. We have a gigantic social media following of hundreds of thousands on Twitter and, and over half a million on Facebook. Uh, we have a LinkedIn group with over 100,000 members. We have 56,000 people that follow our company on LinkedIn. We've built this really, really big audience by doing this inbound stuff really well. And that means that I continue to have interactions and attract more people to our company at a really, really low cost because I'm not paying for any of this stuff on a metered sort of you know, advertising kind of rate. Um, the other thing that this does is I think it ends up giving you a, a, that marketing can actually become a competitive advantage. If you think you were to say, okay, well, we're really good at buying advertising, is that really bringing inherent value to your business? Is somebody that's gonna potentially acquire your company or invest in your company say, oh, because you're really good at advertising, you're really good at buying Google AdWords, I think that's worth you know, X amount more in the valuation of your company. I, I think that's probably pretty unlikely. But what I would argue is if, if you're in an industry where you have more Twitter followers than Salesforce.com, more people linking to your website than Salesforce.com, more Facebook fans than Salesforce.com, those are things that you actually, those are assets you can actually leverage and use that to get more customers and to grow. And I would argue that we've been able to, it's not the only thing that makes us a valuable company, but that having that huge digital footprint is actually marketing competitive advantage because we can prove to people that we can acquire customers at a faster rate and for less money, which gives us an advantage over any potential competition. It's also really hard to catch up. There is no store on the internet where Mark Benioff can buy another 20,000 links into his website, right? It doesn't exist, even if he pays in Bitcoin or wherever he wants, right? Like it's really, really hard for him to do that because they need to do the hard work of writing thousands and thousands of blog articles that are really good that people want to share and things like that. So a lot of this stuff, is, it takes time to build up. And I think that that makes it a huge, huge advantage for any potential startup to actually add a competitive advantage to your business and use marketing and inbound marketing as a competitive advantage. All right. Uh, I talked about these things. You can't build this stuff over my net, it's important. All right, so what does this mean for how like, our funnel works at HubSpot? And then I'm gonna talk about some of the examples related to the class specifically. So for us, uh, we generate, you know, it's a few million visitors to our website. We get about 50,000 new leads per month. And those are new contact names that are opting in, giving us their content information, opting in to download some content from us and get further communication. It's a huge spread of where that stuff comes from. So some of it is people that have heard about HubSpot from their friends and they typed in HubSpot.com. Some of it is, a lot of it is from our blog. Some of it is from SEO straight into our website. A uh, decent amount of it is actually straight from social media. Um, free tools, which I'll talk about an example of in a minute. The biggest tool is Marketing Grader. We have a lot coming in from that. Um, sending email to people that are already in your database, people forward it around and that actually generates new names in your database, which is a really powerful thing. But I think the most most interesting part of all this for us is that 80% of the lead generation that we do is unpaid. So only 20% of the lead gen that we do is paid. Most companies, that ratio is the other way around. Uh, and that's part of that huge advantage that I feel like we have because we've been working so hard at building this inbound machine for so long. The other thing about that is when we look at the paid leads that we generate versus the inbound leads, the inbound leads are 30, about 30% 30 cheaper and they have a double conversion rate, twice as high a conversion rate with the sales team. So the sales team loves, so I love the inbound leads because they're cheaper and sales loves them because they convert higher. And so the CFO loves them, the CEO loves them, the board loves them, like everyone loves them. It's like, how do you get more of those, right? Um, so we still do some paid, we do some experimentation. It's good to sort of fill the gaps if things aren't working quite as well. It's an interesting lever to have available, but it's like, I don't think you want that to be the main lever behind your business anymore. There's so many other tools available to you. Now, when I think about that whole funnel and what some of the accelerators, brakes, and gears are, for us, 
um, accelerators. So we have a free trial. It's huge. And part of the reason why it's huge is a lot of our competitors don't. So our salespeople, many times salespeople won't want to give in, in general, wouldn't want to give customers a trial of the product. But many times our sales reps will do it because they'll know what else other co the customer is looking at. And they'll know in their head like, oh, they either don't have a trial at all or they have a trial and I know the product is really hard to use. And so I'm gonna actually proactively offer the customer, like, oh, I, you haven't started a trial. Do you, do you wanna start a trial? And by the way, anyone else you're talking to, you should ask them about a trial. And their sales rep is like, oh, this is gonna be awesome because he's gonna call up so-and-so and ask them for a trial and they don't even have a trial. And then the customer's saying, well, why won't you give me a trial? Like, that's like why, why do you not have a trial, right? And that's sort of, it sounds suspicious, right? So, so things like that, that, the free trial works really well for us. Um, marketing Grader, so it's a free tool. I'll go through a screenshot example of that in a second. That's been awesome for us. Educational content about inbound. So you heard Unidesk has this really specific, like if people believe these things, then they're an awesome fit customer for us. We have the same thing. If you really, really buy into inbound, I gave you a mini version of the inbound pitch earlier. If you really buy into that, you're a great HubSpot customer. Part of what we do in marketing is educate the world so we have more people that, am, that end up believing those things. So in many ways, I'm sort of building my own cult or trying to build my own religion to get people to believe the same things that we believe. And I'm sure that part of Unidesk's strategy over time is to get more people to believe those things because only so many people believe them today, but like, how do you grow the number of people that believe those things? Um, so we do a lot of that stuff. And as part of that, right, if people have used your product before, we're starting to see more and more of this as we become an older company and have more and more customers. If people have used our product before, that is a gigantic accelerator. It is like when one of them, we're actually trying to figure out exactly anytime one of our, cu one of our customer users leaves their company is like, how do we figure out that, that as a trigger? We're trying, it's really hard to do, but we're trying to figure that out because that's a huge accelerator for us. Uh, things that are breaks for us, people that are unwilling to embrace inbound, so don't believe what we believe, right? That's huge. Uh, and then we have this other problem where there's conservative buyers that for some crazy reason think a company with 10,000 customers and all these case studies is like the, the, you know, because we're new and because we're a little edgy and because we have a different view on the world, that we're not a safe play, right? Um, I would argue that would have been true five or six years ago, but probably no longer true today. We've raised a ton of money, like we're doing great, like we have lots of customers in all sorts of places around the world, but there's still people who feel that way. And that's definitely like a break that occasionally we need to overcome. Um, some of the clutches that we engage to, to overcome some of those things um, or some, overcome some bumps in the process. Uh, calls to action on content, I'm gonna talk about that as a specific example in a second. Uh, and then especially around people that don't sort of believe, the well, people that are concerned that HubSpot is not a safe choice. We have a whole new program. We're doing tons of what I would call reference selling where lots more case studies. We're trying to do, actually, we launched seven new case studies this month and seven last month. So we've really ramped up the number of case studies we're publishing. Um, lots of references. We actually have a program internally for customers that are either super happy with HubSpot or used HubSpot and then switched from something else where we actually have a list of those internally and there's an easy way for sales reps to get those customers on the phone, sort of like, like Unidesk was talking about or getting, getting the, I forget what company it was from, but somebody from a law firm dialed in to one of the pitches that they were in recently. Same type of thing, we're trying to enable that. Now we have over 100 sales reps, so you need a little more program around it, but we try to enable the same type of thing. Um, and third party validation. So we're trying to figure out, um, you know, the, the traditional way of doing this is like the traditional like analysts within our industry, but we're trying to figure out there's sort of some new things. There's actually a few sites that are like Yelp, but for B2B software. G2 Crowd, Trust Radius, and actually VentureBeat is trying to, starting to do some of the same stuff. We've been leveraging our 10,000 customers and encouraging them, the happy ones especially, to leave reviews on all these sites. And we now are the number one rated among those three different websites based on customer feedback and customer reviews. That doesn't happen overnight. Like there's a lot of work to do that type of stuff. Um, and we do a lot of that stuff. So those are the type of ways we sort of overcome those, those, uh, those objections sometimes in the process. The two examples I wanted to go through, and I referenced these in a second ago, one is Marketing Grader. Uh, this has been huge. Uh, one of our co-founders, our technical co-founder, Darmesh, built this um, like the month that I joined. So it was like a brand new head of marketing's like best gift ever uh, because he built this. I started doing some marketing of it. I started posting about it in social media and posting about it in a bunch of like internet marketing forums and things like that. And all of a sudden it started to take off and people would grade their own, uh, basically you type in your URL of your company and it gives you a score and a bunch of feedback about what you're doing good and what you're doing not so good for your online marketing. And so it's free, it takes about a minute or two and it provides a ton of value uh, and it's completely customized to you and your company. So super, super valuable. 
what happened with it is people would start to run their own website, then they would run their friend's website and be like, hee hee, I got a five, higher, five point higher score than yours, and they would send it to their friends. And then VCs would start to find it, and they would run all their portfolio companies, and they would send it to the head of marketing at every portfolio company, right? And then they'd be like, why'd you get a 42? I thought we gave you all this money last year. Like, what's going on with your marketing, right? Um, and sometimes the nice VCs would also send, I'm sure like Michael did, oh, you got an 85, you're doing great, right? So not all VCs are like that, but Michael is. Um, <laughs> Uh, so it started to sort of spread that way. Um, you know, people would run each other's sites. There was just a lot of that sort of virality that started to happen with it that we saw. Uh, and it ended up now through today, there's been over 4 million, I think 5 million, but at least 4 million different organizations that have run their site, their company through Marketing Grader, uh, which has been tremendous. Now the key thing here is like, not just like, hey, here's a bunch of free info, and then like no follow up. You need to make that next step really clear so within Marketing Grader, and we've experimented lots of different ways over time, but you give somebody a ton of value, you need to tell them what that next step is. This is where like the clutch comes in, like the customer could get stuck here and be like, wow, I have all this work to do, gosh, what am I gonna do? But if you make it easy, you're like, hey, do you want an easy way of fixing all these problems? Like click this button and just do a couple more things, right? Um, and so that's sort of the key here. It's like provide a bunch of value, but provide that next step. The next example I'll talk about is our blog. So the blog is how we um, educate, which is marketing speak for brainwash, uh, people about how important inbound is, right? Uh, and we publish hundreds of articles per month uh, and we, on all sorts of different topics, mostly marketing and sales, we have a few other topics we cover. Uh, and so the blog is great. Here's one article that had, you know, a thousand tweets and 500 shares on LinkedIn. So relatively, you know, uh, uh, relatively successful article. This one's actually a couple years old. Um, but the idea is the same. So you provide a lot of education, a lot of information. This is important. You get more people to believe the same things you believe so they're more likely to purchase from you. That's great. But the issue here is you want to be careful. I can't tell you how many company blogs I go to and it's like you read this article and you're like, okay, I believe more of the things that you believe. I think I'm a little bit ready. This is interesting, whatever. But there's no like, kind of like what's the next thing to happen, right? So the key with the blog is at the bottom of every single article you have to add a call to action and you have to let the customer know what they should do next. When we went from not having these calls to action to having them, we tripled the number of leads from our blog within like a week. It was an, ins and this is something we've been talking about for years, so more and more people are starting to set this thing up right. Um, you, if you wanna get extra sophisticated here, you can start to target the call to action according to the content of the blog article and if you want to get even more sophisticated and get even better results, you can also target it by where that person is in your sales process. So for those of you, any of you in this audience that are a HubSpot customer, you'll come to our blog, you get at the bottom of the blog article, and you'll see something like, hey, like, thanks for being a customer, have you registered for our inbound conference in September, right? If you have never been to our site before, you'll get something that's you know, a little bit more education. It'll be about, hey, you know, in this case, you know, here's, a, here's an article and it's like, okay, well, here's an ebook about how to create lovable marketing campaigns. Very, very much early on in the sales process, we still have more brainwashing, more education to do before you're ready. If you're somewhere in the middle, maybe you've downloaded one of these before and you're talking to a sales rep, maybe the offer will be, hey, to start a free trial or something like that. Um, so we, tr we try to get relatively sophisticated here, but at a basic level, the first thing to do is make sure you have a call to action, make sure you're offering a customer that next step of the next thing that they should do in the process. Uh, and then all of these link to a well-optimized landing page, so you're gathering information. Um, uh, that's sort of like the key things there. Um, so I'm happy to, I think Michael and I, we were gonna maybe chat for a moment or two. I'm sure there are hopefully a lot of interesting questions for folks, but um, those are at least the basics that I was thinking of in terms of this, this presentation in this class. Impossible. thank you very much. Thank you. It's hard to cover an entire subject in, uh, in, in a few in minutes. A few yeah. minutes then, but you did a great job. Uh, so we have a question that came right up, so I'm going to just um, bring it up right away, which is how much of this um, could be applied to the mobile apps business and how would you might think about it if you're developing mobile apps? Obviously, we've got somebody in the audience who's doing that. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> uh, so I think mobile apps are interesting. I think a lot of the same principles apply. So when you think about ranking high in search engines, mm -hmm. all of the... Um, uh, all of the app stores are essentially a search engine, and there's such a thing as like, you know, I'm sure if you know anything about mobile apps, you're thinking about how do you do app store optimization. Uh, so that would be the first potential thing. So it's like thinking about the same concepts of SEO, mostly apply there. Uh, the, I think the second thing would be 
Um, that idea of providing value uh, as early on as possible, and you can do that through either a free version of the app and making or making the whole app free and then doing in-app purchases in order to get revenue, things like that. Um, I think things like that can be really, really effective. Um, uh, I would say those are probably the big examples. I'm sure there's a million more. Um, but yeah, I think, I think the interesting part of the, mo the mobile app business is typically the revenue per customer is so low yeah. that it's, it's, it can be really, there are some ways to do some cheap mobile advertising, but typically you need to figure out how to make that inbound really work well. And some of it may come from virality within the app itself, so you use existing customers to get more new customers, things like that too. Yeah, so the, qu the question is basically they have a, a recommendation app where people are making videos and doing recommendations of products, services, it sounds like businesses, uh, and how do you get that to grow? That sounds to me like there's a potentially a really big opportunity to tie into existing social networks. Right. Right. I think a lot of apps sort of grow by piggybacking on, and you can imagine a, oh, well, do you want to post this video recommendation to Facebook? And then, by the way, let all your friends know on Facebook that you're using this cool new app. Uh, a lot of Pinterest growth in the early days was because they kind of spammed the Facebook feed, right? And if you can, I think the big thing there would be to tie into a lot of the other existing. Um, uh, networks and you have to think about what the right ones are based on your right customers, whether it's you know these days Instagram or some other, right? So um, I think there's a bunch of potential things there, but I would try to leverage existing social networks. That sounds like who could work well maybe. Great. Other questions before I ask one? Uh, hi. A large proportion of the work that you're doing is underpinned by content. Yeah. How do you staff up and where do you where do you proliferate that content from within your own organization and how much of your marketing time does that take? Yeah, about 15% uh, of our marketing team is completely 100% dedicated to producing this type of content. And then out of the other 80% of the team, uh, they spend some portion of their time. So we spend a lot of time on this stuff. The way I would think about it is, I, I actually, earlier today, I'll give you an example. I was talking to the guy, our VP of content, he heads up our whole content team, and he's talking about how he's structuring the team, and he just hired somebody new, and he's making a couple changes, and what he's gonna do to scale up and drive more leads through our blog. And he basically said, okay, um, if I can have one more person, I think I can write this many more articles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And by the way, I already cut a deal with the guy who runs the paid advertising budget that as long as I can do this many new blog articles that he'll give me X thousand dollars per month so I can go hire the new person. And I'm like, perfect, this is exactly what should be happening. And when the team was smaller, I managed the whole thing myself, that was what would happen. So I would take dollars that we had traditionally put into advertising and try as much as possible as soon as I could find good content people to hire them and spend the money there instead. Yeah. What's the profile you hire to? So if you, if fifteen percent of your marketing team is content people, yeah, are you hiring writers, PRs? You know, where are you finding the content developers? Yeah, more. So uh, I have like an hour-long presentation about like that particular topic about organization of the team and the type of person. The uh, we use an acronym called DARC, D A R C, and that's kind of for marketers in general, but it's digital analytical. They have some level of reach and also content. Around the content role specifically, I think the great, uh, the bad news for the journalism industry, but the good news for the marketing industry is that journalism is a rough industry to be in now, and it means as a marketer you can hire lots of folks um, that have a journalism background and are great at content um, into roles where they can create more content for your company. Uh, so I think I think more of a journalism kind of content role can be really really effective. The 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 tough part comes when you maybe have a topic area that is so technically detailed that a journalist, a journalist might not be able to pick up enough of it to credibly write content for that audience. So Unidesk is, I would say, potentially, I don't know enough about it because I'm not smart enough, but potentially a type of company where the people that are blogging for their IT folks, you might need someone more sophisticated than a journalist. Uh, and that becomes a little bit more difficult in those instances. And then you can do things like maybe use a journalist, like it sounds like they have a marketing person that listens to the customer webinars. So they have the customer create content, so you can use customers to create the content, and then maybe have a journalist or a marketing person kind of try to polish it up and reformat it a little bit and do some things like that, so that's one solution. You can also just hire an industry expert um, and actually turn them, instead of doing, you know, being 
using their technical skills that actually make that outward facing and create more content. So it sort of depends. And that, and that can exist in the consumer world too because there are sometimes that consumer products that have a high degree of, uh, of sort of knowledge about them sometimes. Uh, but the fundamental answer is hire more journalists. Um, you talked about the need to kind of start this process for creating these marketing assets early. And I'm wondering how early? So is there a point where you know it's too early in the process to start doing that? Or no matter what, as long as you're kind of putting out quality content about your product and, and leading to it, that, that's a good thing to start? I think a great way to think about um, market validation and uh, to think about having an asset that you can walk into your first you know, seed stage or angel stage investor meeting is to be, hey, uh, I don't really quite have a product yet. Here's this sort of quasi non-working beta thing, whatever. But I've been blogging about this particular topic for a year. Here's all the blog posts. Here's the amount of followers I have. Here's the amount of traffic on my blog. Here are the questions people are asking me about. Oh, and by the way, I published a survey out to my 10,000 blog readers. And here's the things that they said were really core problems. And here's how much they said they would pay if we could solve those problems. Like, wow, that's fascinating, right? as opposed to walking in and having a company where you're build, spending all this time building the product. I think that right now, um, because it's so uh, relatively inexpensive to become your own publisher and build an audience today, um, that to me, I would start doing that before the product. And by the way, if you can't effectively build an audience to read your blog, then you probably are in the wrong market or thinking about something wrong. I think in some ways you almost want to start that before it's like an earlier stage. It's a little bit of a contribution viewpoint probably, but uh, I think there's a real case to be made that it's never too early, even way before you even have any kind of a product to offer. So I'm so glad that question came up and that was exactly the, you know, the discussion I hope we'd bring up. Because actually people really miss this opportunity. Not only is it an opportunity to establish you know, what might be your target market, what might be your segment, what might be the pain points, what might be the way in which you engage them, but also it tells us something as VCs if you're approaching us, for example, which is you're thinking about the customer first because the opposite is usually true, which is people think about the product and then the customer. And as we all know, well, if you don't, you certainly should hear it in my classes. <laughs> it's the end result of companies um, when you look at their P&Ls is they're spending triple on average more on sales and marketing than they are on product development, even in steady state. And in the early stages, it's usually significantly more than that. So if you can figure out how to do what Mike's saying, which is you know, really get this working for you early on, and you get validation, you get focus, and you get obviously a machine starting to work for you, and assets that can live you know, as you build your company, it's really terrific. So thank you for bringing that up. But again, Mike, thank you very thank much. You. This is a terrific. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. <laughs>